Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Acing the Interview, our third webinar in our three-part series with Phase AI. Let's face it, uh, interviews are one of those life events that produce incredibly polarizing emotions. There's excitement and anticipation, often mixed with a heavy serving of stress and anxiety. And today's session will provide lots of good insights and tips to help you prepare to bring the best version of yourself to the interview process. My name is Melissa Judd, and on behalf of everyone at Vector, thanks for spending some time with us today. I'd also like to thank our funders, the province of Ontario, the Government of Canada through the Pan-Canadian AI strategy administered by CIFAR, and industry sponsors from across the Canadian economy. I also wanted to pause to acknowledge the land on which Vector is located in Toronto, what is now a meeting place for many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, as well as newcomers to Canada from around the globe. The land we are situated on is a traditional territory of many nations, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. We are grateful for being hosted on this land. Before I pass the screen over to Wojciech and Andrea from Phase AI, I did want to draw your attention to a couple of things that are on tap next week. Uh, one is summer internship deadline at Vector. We have posted a number of full and part-time roles uh, that are internships with our health team, industry, AI engineering, and most importantly, uh, academic partnerships. We have uh, a couple of roles. One's an automation role and the other's a data visualization role. I'd encourage you to check them out and apply if you're interested. The deadline for applications is March 22nd. I also wanted to highlight that we are hosting a recruitment session with Thomson Reuters uh, on March 25th. They are hiring in abundance. They have full-time and internship opportunities for you to explore. And uh, the session is a really good and interactive way. Uh, you will get to interact on sort of live chat and screen with both technical teams and recruiters from the company. So we'll just drop the registration in the chat for that too. So now for a very brief introduction uh, of the two co-founders of Phase AI, who we've really had uh, a great time working with over the past three months. Wojciech Grick is an AI researcher and data scientist and an alumnus of Oxford University, where he studied on a Rhodes Scholarship. In addition to founding and selling his own company in customer analytics, he's worked at a number of organizations to research and build AI-driven products. Joining him is Andrea Yip, who is a scientist, designer, and researcher. Andrea's had one of those incredibly interesting careers, and one of the things that she works on is helping biotech companies plan research missions to space. How cool is that? Andrea is an alumna of the University of Toronto with a Master in Public Health. Please join me in welcoming them here today. Melissa, thank you so much for, for having us today. We're, we're excited to be here uh, and, and hope that this webinar will be as helpful as the others have been. Um, Andrea will be joining us at the end of the webinar to help with coordinating uh, uh, the questions and Q&A. However, if you do have, have anything come up uh, during the webinar itself, feel free to submit those questions early and we'll try to address them uh, throughout the presentation. So Andrea, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. See you soon. Perfect. So uh, as, as Melissa mentioned, today's webinar is focused on acing data and AI interviews. And this is one of these uh, uh, very nerve wracking <laughs> uh, uh, parts of the interview process because they're usually so different across companies. And of course, it's a place where you actually meet lots of people and, and, uh, and, and you're tested on a whole range of skills. Um, before we actually get started and discuss the actual steps to an interview process and how you could prepare, 
I'd like to start with the story that has been uh, flowing and threading through all of the webinars that we've been running, which is around this idea of DataCo. It's a company that we were working with uh, several months ago to help build out an AI team of about four people uh, across a number of roles, data science, ML, research, engineering. Now, when, when they actually started hiring and uh, announced the four roles they were looking for candidates for, for, they got a total of 6,000 applicants. Of those 6,000 applicants, about 1,000 applied for two or more roles. So lots of confusion, lots of lack of clarity when it comes to uh, the roles and responsibilities people were applying for. And also from a candidate perspective, I don't think many candidates were clear in terms of what they were applying for or, or how the roles differed. Of those 6,000, about 100 went to a phone screen, so one in 60. And of the 100 phone screens, there were 10 final interviews. And of those 10 final interviews, six offers. Now, this was only for four roles. So, you know, even at the offer stage, things sometimes didn't work out for either the candidate or the employer. In webinar one, we covered your online profile to, to really help you show why you're great. Uh, and this is really important, particularly for the early stage in uh, building out the relationship with the company and moving from that massive pile of candidates to, to actually getting the company's attention, having a conversation with the recruiter, et cetera. In the second webinar, we covered why are you great for this role? Whichever role that is you're applying for, you want to be intentional about actually choosing the right roles, about presenting yourself for that specific role so that not only do you get an interview, but are actually successful both within that role, but also within your career overall. And given a lot of the, the, the evolution and, and lack of clarity in data science today when it comes to roles and role definition, this is particularly important. Today, we'll be discussing why are you the best fit? Why out of that 6,000 candidate pool, you're the right person for the specific role that you've chosen to apply for. Um, so that you get that offer and build a relationship or alternatively know how to iterate on your, on your application so that uh, whether it's the second or third application, you'll definitely be successful. In terms of today's agenda, there's, there's five uh, areas that we'll cover. The first one is what is the interview process actually like? What are some of the common steps and, and processes that we go through as recruiters or hiring managers to actually uh, test a candidate and, and build a relationship with them? We'll break this down into the specific steps. We'll also talk a little bit about what the company and the employer is looking for when it comes to those specific steps. Uh, we'll talk about how to prepare for those interviews, and specifically, we'll dive into role-based questions. And what we mean by this is uh, uh, one of the things that people really get nervous about are take-home tests or, or, or skill-based tests during the interview process itself. And we'll show you how you can, A, prepare for them, particularly if you're applying for analyst roles, data engineering roles, or ML researcher roles, and, and how you could just make sure that you're as successful as possible. And we'll wrap everything up with revisiting the idea of telling your story. How do you not only ace that interview and, and those tests, but actually use all of this to build a bigger profile and a stronger, uh, more prominent profile for yourself within the data science community and the data industry overall. So I'll begin with the interview process itself. What is it actually like? What does it look like? How does it feel? And Again, you'll, you might remember this from webinar one. We talked a little bit about who you need to convince in the first place. Who's actually designing this? Who are the stakeholders? And there's a few people that you meet early on in the interview process. The first is the recruiter. So this is the person that is managing the whole process. They're responsible for the job posting that gets the 6,000 applicants or the multiple job postings that get the 6,000 applicants. And they're also responsible for narrowing down that those 6,000 to the 100 in the phone screen or maybe the 10 that actually get invited into the interview itself. Oftentimes they're a professional recruiter, either internal to the company or maybe it's an external agency. But what I mean by this is they're not subject matter experts. They are people who are uh, specifically focused on the talent acquisition process or the recruiting process. But, but you probably know a lot more about your experience, obviously, and about your field than they do. The next person is the hiring manager. They might be doing the phone screen. Uh, they, they'll certainly be running uh, the interview process, 
they're responsible for actually filling the role itself. So whereas the recruiter sends a pipeline of candidates to the hiring manager, the hiring manager's core focus, job, goal is, is to actually put, put you in the role itself, make sure that you're the best candidate and make sure that you're going to be successful both before you get hired and of course, while you're onboarding and while you're an employee, there's a very good chance you'll be reporting to the hiring manager or they might be overseeing the team that you're a part of uh, when it comes to actually filling the role itself. The third set of stakeholders is the team. Um, so this is the, the hiring manager's team. It's the team that you'll be joining. And, and the team you almost, well, you rarely meet them when, uh, when you're actually doing the phone screens, but you will definitely be meeting them when it comes to the later stage components of the interview. Uh, uh, they don't have really a veto when it comes to saying whether or not you'll be hired, but they'll have a lot of input. And more importantly for you, these are going to be your coworkers. So you want to make sure you get along with them. You want to make sure that uh, uh, they have the same values and a cultural approach to work that you do. All of this is very important. And it's important to remember that not only are they interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them because you'll be spending a lot of time with them. And lastly, you've got the company as a whole. Typically, near the very end of the process, you'll meet more senior stakeholders within the company. Uh, in smaller companies, these might be the C-level executives. Uh, in the case of startups, they might be the founders themselves. Uh, in bigger companies, these might be VPs, someone, uh, someone that the hiring manager reports to, for example. The goal with the company being involved in the process is to really see that you fit into the broader culture and the broader behavior of the company itself. In a similar way for you, you'll wanna make sure that you feel comfortable when you're presenting to these folks or, or getting to know them in some way. The company is typically involved in the later, the, the last, last stages of the interview process itself, like a stakeholder presentation or a take home test. So when we're talking about the process itself, we'll be covering a little bit about these four stakeholders, but putting yourself in, in the applicant's shoes or as you're going through the process, just remember that these four groups of stakeholders are different, they have different goals, and you'll also learn different things from them in terms of uh, whether you're a good fit or whether it makes sense to work at the company that you're applying for. Now, I'll breeze through this slide fairly quickly because we'll dive into a lot more detail later. But the interview process itself is unique to every company, but there's typically six steps that we see are pretty common. Um, there's a phone screen. Uh, more often than not, right now, this might actually be a Zoom video screen of some sort. Uh, but the idea here is this is the recruiter hopping on a call with you. There's a remote interview, which focuses specifically on meeting the hiring manager and diving into your technical skill set. There's a testing component, either with the company or maybe a third party testing agency, just to make sure that you actually have the skills that you said you had. There's the on site interview, there's the stakeholder presentation within the on site interview, and the negotiation. So we'll dive into all of these a bit later. Uh, but, but, and you know, as I mentioned, there might be two phone screens in certain places, or you might do the test later on in the process. But generally speaking, these are the six parts that we'll be, we'll be diving into a lot of detail. Now, regardless of the six parts, whether you're doing a phone screen or a stakeholder presentation, one of the things that we constantly remind folks about is this idea of JET uh, or the JET framework for us, which is avoid jargon, emphasize your end-to-end -end projects and be top-down. And this is particularly true when you're dealing with more senior stakeholders within a company. Data science is a jargon-filled field. Uh, and, and when it comes to research, when it comes to, to the actual work that you've done in your master's program or PhD, you've spent a lot of time really diving into the details. And you are almost certainly an expert in, in your field and know more about your field than any of the folks that you'll be meeting. And as a result, uh, what I often find when we're interviewing folks who have those academic backgrounds, they dive into the details to a level where no one understands what, people, what, what they're actually saying. And so it's important to use analogies or use simpler words that aren't uh, uh, specific to your field just to get people to understand what, what, what you did and, and how you did it. This is particularly true for recruiters that are not technical at that very first stage, as well as the, the broader company and executive uh, teams. End-to-end -end projects are important because it helps people see that you can actually deliver on a problem or a, or a goal. Uh, it's really hard to see 
uh, sometimes what a person is capable of doing when they're talking about their research or abstract ideas. But when you can show something and say, here's something I've built or here's something I've written or de delivered, et cetera, then, then that's much clearer. And top down is important because it, it actually saves a lot of time. Uh, you, if you start at a very high level and say, here's what I've built, let the company, the recruiter, the stakeholders ask if they want more detail. Maybe they're happy with what you've presented and you've just saved yourself 10 minutes of presenting time. The other thing that you want to focus on, and we, we spent a lot of time on this in the first webinar, but it's, it's particularly important in the interviews, is presenting yourself and the vision for yourself. Have a 30-second elevator pitch about yourself. Have a five-minute career overview. What got you to where you are today? And why are you applying for this role that, that, that seems so interesting or relevant to your skill set? And also have a vision for the future. Where do you see yourself five or 10 years from now? And how does the role that you're applying for actually relate to this? Now, what's important here is this isn't meant to be a plan for self-actualization or anything like that. The point here is very much to tie your story to the company show that the company and, and the fact that you'll be working there, the role that you're applying for, if you get it, not only is it, not only are you a good fit for the role, but it's actually, you're a strategic fit for the role. And, and in a similar way, you'll be committed because there's a whole story that, that you're a part of here and that this company will play a role in your life for. In terms of principles, be promotional. Think big, have big positive visions for yourself. Uh, this is really, really important to capture people's imaginations. Be pithy and unique. Uh, oftentimes, people will have very general stories about themselves, which there's technically nothing wrong with that, but it's also difficult to remember you specifically as an individual if you have the same story as, as three or four other candidates. And again, emphasize how this helps your target. How does this help the recruiter tell a story about why you're a great candidate? How does this convince the, the executive team in a stakeholder presentation that you are going to kick serious butt when you're actually hired? Now, our advice in terms of how to do this, and, and you'll hear this advice a lot throughout this presentation, is practice, practice, practice. My goal when it comes to uh, any sort of interview that I'm helping people prepare for, or even for my own interviews, is I should never be doing the thing I'm doing in the interview for the first time in the interview. So if that means a coding test, I should be doing coding tests on my own ahead of time. When it comes to presenting my resume and portfolio, I better know it very, very, very well. And it surprises me sometimes when I have candidates that I'm interviewing where they finished their, dis their master's degree or PhD a year or two ago. And I asked them what it was about and they say they don't really remember the details. I'm like, you spent two years on this thing. It's important to remember the details because you're gonna have a lot of details to remember when you're, when you're working for me. Um, one way that, that works really well here in terms of preparing is recording yourself. Uh, this is, again, very true in, 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 in this particular period uh, with COVID because most of your interviews, if not all of them, will be video interviews. So actually recording yourself and, and seeing how it plays back, uh, reflecting on whether you took too long or, or skipped certain sections or whatever else, you can do all of that so that every single interview is not the first time you're answering a question. And of course, show up well. Uh, this is also uh, extremely important. I think sometimes we get a little lax, especially with remote interviews. Uh, work on your lighting, audio, make sure you have a great webcam, a good internet connection. And this is also particularly true if the role you're applying for is something that is the perfect role for you. You know, you might not have time to do this level of prep for every job you apply for, but when you're applying for the perfect role, you definitely want to invest in this. Think about this pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, what we actually ended up doing is flying you in for an interview. So now we can't do that, but the, the actual merit of, of that internet connection or maybe renting even a part-time office for an hour or two uh, uh, to make sure that we show up as well as possible is really, really, really valuable. Um, in a similar way, dress codes uh, are very immensely when it comes to companies, especially right now. So asking the recruiter potentially some of these questions to make sure you show up well is really critical. And finally, uh, when it comes to preparing, you'll also want to understand the company itself, uh, understand where they're coming from, who they are, and how their culture might impact you during the interview process and more broadly. There's a lot of reviews online right now. 
where you could read about the interview process for specific companies on websites like Glassdoor or, or other social media. Uh, you could find most of your potential coworkers on LinkedIn, see where they worked before they joined the company, see where which schools they went to. A lot of companies have certain uh, preferred or default pathways. They have feeder schools they like to hire at or, or certain roles that they like to fill uh, uh, with people with specific backgrounds. And how do they present themselves? Are they really, really corporate? Do they try to seem like they're very informal? Um, does it feel like a big company, like a small company? All of this is stuff that you can find online. And of course, you can find sample interview questions online as well. More broadly, particularly when you're getting through to the executive level uh, uh, interviews and stakeholder presentations, try to understand the company's uh, specific challenges and opportunities. So what are their goals uh, as a company? Are they launching a new product? Uh, do they need internal consultants? Are they growing rapidly? This is all important to frame how your contribution will actually uh, play a role in allowing the company to achieve its strategic goals. And one thing that I always remind candidates here is, you know, your technical skills are important, of course, and the way you present yourself is important. But if you convince the hiring manager and the executive team that you are a strategic hire, that regardless of your skill set, when you show up, uh, and, and, and actually get hired, you will help the company achieve its strategic goals in any way possible, you're gonna get the job pretty much no matter what. Uh, now, how often should you prepare for this? Well, you know, I like to use the number of 50 role plays. Uh, I remember when I uh, was finishing grad school and applying for, for my first uh, full-time permanent job, uh, I wanted to be a consultant and I got the interview uh, I knew the interview was coming. I bought a bunch of case books where you literally had uh, 10, 20, 30 uh, sample interview cases. And I ran through 50 of them. Three hours a day uh, for, for about three weeks, I would uh, go through two or three case interviews on my own. Um, and this might sound crazy, uh, but actually one of the things that I find is for people who are really, really passionate and really care about the role that they're applying for, this seems to be the magic number. When you've done something 50 times, you can do it in your sleep. So the interview process actually becomes so simple and so easy for folks. I mean, they still get nervous and the jitters when it comes to meeting new people, but at least the actual process of the interview uh, is, is, is pretty, pretty simple. The other thing that I would recommend here is you could practice on your own. It's okay to just review yourself from a recording perspective or a whiteboarding perspective. You could obviously practice with friends or people who are applying for similar roles. The other thing I highly recommend is ask the recruiter if they do sample or, 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 or prep interviews. A lot of companies actually will do this if you ask them. Uh, the recruiter might at least give you some, some tips on how to be successful, but they might even spend an hour with you to actually role play the interview with you later. Um, and and the, if anyone knows bad, best how the process looks, it's the recruiter. Uh, the other thing that comes up more and more now is working with a coach. This can be quite expensive and the, the quality uh, of the experience can vary drastically, uh, but, uh, but it is an option if you're particularly nervous or, or not sure what to expect. And of course, practice questions, as we mentioned, they're available everywhere. Um, and a lot of companies actually uh, will have pages on their careers website, like the Shopify screenshot, where you could go and see how they're thinking about you without asking the recruiter, simply just reading the advice and guidelines. Um, and of course, social media like Reddit or, or, or Hacker News, a lot of people talk about their interview processes there as well. Um, so, so you could visit that. So in terms of, in terms of the strategy, uh, Role play, practice, 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 be top down, avoid jargon. Uh, there's a lot there. We'll break down the specific six steps that we mentioned uh, earlier now, just to give you an idea of what this looks like and how you can specifically tactically uh, uh, do well in each one. So the first piece is the phone screen. The main, main goal with the phone screen is giving the recruiter a reason to advance you to the hiring manager. Remember again that the recruiter is typically not a subject matter expert. They're almost certainly not uh, as technical as you are. They might have a, a, a high level technical background, but really their goal is to make the process efficient and they're trying to avoid false positives. And what I mean by false positives is they, they don't want to pass people on that are obviously bad fits. Um, and so, so that's what they're trying to do is 
tell the story for themselves why you're a good fit or why you're not a good fit. So the more you can do that, the better. Uh, for, for this and the other sections, we'll constantly rem remind you to have the projects that you can share, whether that's a portfolio, whether it's a discussion on research that you've done. But the point is to be pithy, to be to be quick to it, and also to have a few examples, because if one doesn't resonate, you could give another example. Or if you meet multiple recruiters, you could actually share multiple stories. The other piece that I find most people uh, uh, struggle with here is come with questions. This recruiter knows the process so well and probably has done it hundreds of times. So asking them what the process is like, what success, successful candidates do to, to be successful, their job is to answer those questions. So you might as well ask them. The hiring manager is somewhat similar, but obviously a lot more detailed. Uh, they will be the first step in the process where they'll have a bit of a high level technical screen. Typically, it's very informal. They'll ask questions. They'll ask you to go through a project, but they'll ask specific details. Like if, if, you, if you said that you used PyTorch and you built your own model or neural network architecture, what did it look like? How did you know to build the architecture in that specific way? What was the outcome? Um, the point here is the hiring manager wants to really validate what the recruiter told them and to validate that your resume, the skills you've listed and uh, and the experiences you've described are ones that actually seem to resonate and that you know them well. An important part here is to have key takeaways for the hiring manager, really have two or three points that you want them to remember. And, re and more broadly, they're trying to de-risk you. They're going to introduce you to the team. They're potentially going to be your boss uh, or potentially your boss's boss. Um, from that perspective, what they want to do is make sure that you're actually a good fit, that you will be a productive fantastic, positive member of the team. Now, testing is one that comes up in multiple places. And uh, for bigger companies, you might actually do the tests before you even talk to the recruiter. Sometimes you'll do the test at the end. But uh, personally, I think this is, this is the ideal spot for tests if I'm helping a company figure out the process. And there's a few types of tests here. There's psychographic tests where they'll try to profile you from a psychological perspective. Um, that's That's still fairly rare but it's becoming more and more common and it's it's usually not meant to actually make a hiring decision but just to help understand who you are there's specific multiple choice screening tests and screening tests are ones where let's say you listed python as a as a a, a skill set or alternatively the company requires python they might make you do a 30 minute uh, or 30 question python test where you answer multiple choice questions or write code snippets just to make sure that you actually know Python to the level that uh, is required. Uh, or, and I use Python as an example, but of course this can be any technical skill. And the third approach, which is probably the most scary for people is uh, a pair programming uh, test where you'll actually have an engineer hop on a call or a, or a screen share with you and you'll be typing and writing code and they'll be observing it and asking questions. Um, those are the scariest ones often for people. And, and I'll say, here's the secret. They are uh, nerve wracking for everyone involved. I haven't met many engineers who enjoy doing those things. Uh, they're usually fairly awkward for people. So just remember that. And at the same time, I, the advice here when it comes to tests like this, uh, I would say think out loud, make sure that you're walking the person through your thought process because this is really critical they want to know how you're thinking not the specific letters that you're typing on your keyboard number two is ask questions to clarify the process i've, I've had many scenarios where people actually are too afraid to ask whether they can use google or stack overflow during a coding test like this and then they don't use it and it turns out they could have used it all along but you know they got nervous and now their code wasn't quite as good as it should have been, or they didn't know how to look something up. Um, and, and those are things that you want to clarify with the interviewer during the process itself. Now, the on-site interview is what we're going to spend the most time on today. Uh, and so I'll just say very briefly, this is, this is where you meet the whole team. This is where you're going to learn about the culture of the company via all the different team members. These will be your coworkers. You want to show them that you're capable of achieving success in the role that you are uh, applying for. And on the flip side, they'll be getting a feeling for whether or not 
you know, you're someone that they want to spend eight hours a day with, uh, whether virtually or, or in an office environment. And so that means, you know, are you competent? Can you do the things that you say you can do? But also, are you going to just be a good coworker from a culture perspective, from a getting along perspective? Uh, but we'll be talking about this in a lot more detail later. Um, and then with the stakeholder presentation, what, what companies do here is there's two types of approaches. They will either uh, ask you to present something from the take home test in the prior step of the interview, or alternatively, they'll ask you to present on a topic more broadly. We see, we see both approaches. The idea here though, is this stakeholder presentation is really trying to get you to show how you present, how you communicate to the executive team, the founders of the company, the, the VPs in the department, or you know, depending on the size of the company, the goal here is very much communication. They want to see that if you're working on something strategic or solving a problem, that you'll communicate that well and that uh, you have leadership potential. So it's a little different. It's less focused on the skills per se and much more focused on being part of that team and showing leadership and strategic input. And um, one of the things that we often remind people, especially here, is culture fit is often very, very important. Um, in webinar two, we talked a little bit about the different axes that you might want to decide on small company versus large company, corporate environment, more informal, academic, applied. Those are all things that you'll want to be thoughtful about when you're presenting because you, you'll want to align with the culture of the company. The other piece that's important here is remember that throughout this entire process, but particularly when you're meeting the team and the stakeholders, uh, you're interviewing the company as well, as much as everything else. Uh, and, and so what that means is you'll want to make sure you feel comfortable and that you actually feel like this environment is one that will actually enable you to succeed because oftentimes the culture has a bigger impact on your success uh, and the structure of the company has a big impact on your success as well, more so than your specific skill set. Um, now, finally, with the negotiation, uh, this is also a, a really interesting point, and it's one that's overlooked. People say, okay, great, I got my offer. It's, I'm, we're, I'm done. I'm, it's awesome. I'm going to take it. And, uh, and at, or at the same time, this is when they change their, their strategy and become really aggressive or really transactional. And one of the things that, uh, that, that surprises me from that perspective is this is actually when many of the candidates that seem to be perfect, we actually learn. Uh, that they're not as great as we thought, or maybe they're not as thoughtful as we thought. And uh, in a similar way, the way the company treats you here is really telling. A common example that um, is actually, in my opinion, a complete, completely unacceptable approach is exploding offers. You get an offer letter from the company saying you've got 24 hours to, um, to actually accept or, to, or otherwise the offer becomes void. Um, not only is that from an HR policy perspective, not okay, but more broadly, what does it tell you about how the company is going to treat you and ask you for when it comes to major decisions? You need the time. You need to reflect on these things. You might want to talk to a few people and do a reference check on the company. So um, how the company treats you here is very, very important. And also reputation matters a lot from your perspective too. Um, even if the negotiation doesn't work out for whatever reason, or if uh, you don't even get to the negotiation, a lot of recruiters and a lot of hiring managers, they float between companies over their careers. And it's not uncommon for you to meet them again later in a different company or a different role. So making sure that you maintain a really good and positive relationship here is very, very important. And the way that you do that is by following up. So Throughout all of these steps, show interest, add folks that you meet on LinkedIn. If you notice that they have a very specific problem or research area, share a blog post or a research paper that maybe you're familiar with that could contribute to them and ask questions. That curiosity is so exciting and, 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 and valuable. Um, I know personally, and, and certainly with most hiring managers, you know, they actually are very, very keen and excited excited about the pro projects they're working on. They're hiring you because they're growing the team. That means their own responsibilities are changing or growing or expanding. And so within all of this, um, one of the things that's really important is to, to contribute to that positivity and to that, uh, to that success. And, and that's so exciting. So before talking about preparing for interviews, I'm just going to review uh, a few uh, questions here um, that, uh, that are coming up. Um, we'll obviously have more time at the end as well. Um, so the, one of the questions that's coming up is, what sorts of questions do candidates ask that make them memorable? 
This is a really fantastic question. Uh, and I would say that there are two, two buckets of questions that I, uh, I personally really appreciate. Um, and I think a lot of hiring managers do. The first one is, you know, we talked about your five-year vision for yourself and your 10-year vision for yourself and your strategic objectives. I love it when candidates ask me that question or ask, uh, ask me that question in reference to my company. When they're like, well, where does your company want to be five or 10 years from now? What are the broad goals? Like, do you want to be a leader in the industry? Um, and it's interesting because now they're starting to learn about my fears, about my excitement, about, about my goals. And if they turn it into a conversation where they can actually contribute to that, it's very, very powerful. The, uh, the second piece that I would say is asking the company about its challenges. Um, one, of the things, one of the things that uh, you know, we're talking about a lot here is how do you contribute as a candidate to the, to the process, to the company's growth, and show that you're a strategic thinker? Well, learning about what are the top two or three challenges the company has um, is an extremely valuable way to contribute because then you learn about those challenges and maybe you turn this into a conversation or a brainstorm in the interview process itself or after the interview where you share some resources or materials uh, about how the company can achieve its goals. <clears throat> so we'll keep going through, uh, through how to prepare for the interviews. And again, you know, I'll mention this, it's, it's not about coding necessarily. It's about that strategic contribution. It's about thinking about the big picture. This means practicing a lot, making sure you communicate well. It also means having a framework. When you come to all, all of these processes or problems, the company is trying to learn about how you think. So are you strategic or are you tactical? Do you get in the weeds or can you take a step back and really see the big picture? And if you have frameworks that you want to apply here or, or use, that's one way to approach this. And and what I mean by framework specifically is where, uh, you know, as you're preparing for the interviews, there might be two or three ways that you typically approach a problem or a statement that you're comfortable with. Just use those over and over again. It's okay because it means that now you have a process for problem solving, which can be quite powerful. Um, in terms of broader uh, prep, uh, you know, Psychographic filters, again, this is a thing that comes up from a testing perspective now. You can also do a lot of these tests ahead of time just to learn a little bit about yourself and also learn about where your strengths and weaknesses might lie or just how the company might view you from that perspective. Um, Myers-Briggs is a good example. You could probably find three or four different instances online. Um, and knowing yourself and, and, and how you present yourself is really, really important here. Technical filters. Same idea, there's a lot of websites out there now like HackerRank, TripleByte, where you can actually do a sample coding test. Not only do they actually give you feedback, but if you do well, they might even introduce you to offers or opportunities uh, from a career perspective. But most importantly, they will get you uh, that uh, perspective and experience of what it feels like to do a multiple choice test on Python or data science or analytics or whatever. Um, and they'll also tell you how you compare to other candidates in some cases, which can be quite powerful. But most importantly, this means that the first time you do a test for an employer isn't the first time you're doing a test like this at all. Uh, pair programming and remote programming. Again, I would highly recommend uh, role playing this with a friend. Uh, give yourself a problem to build within an hour, see how far you get, uh, um, actually have a friend oversee and look and, and tell you how they understood what you were doing or whether they were confused in some ways as you were typing. And of course, it'll also just show whether your internet connection is good enough and whether your computer can run the various uh, uh, testing platforms. And again, there are quite a lot out there uh, that, that, that you can find if you do a Google search. Whiteboarding test, um, uh, uh, we'll talk about in a lot more detail, but this is again, something where you could basically just ask yourself a question. You know, If I were to build um, a streaming uh, video platform like Netflix, how would it look? What would be the major architectural components of that? Or if I'm going to build, um, build a model to predict whether people pay their bills on time for a bank, what is the data that I need? How does that look? How do I communicate it? And I only have 30 minutes to really walk through it. So you can see how very quickly you can start asking yourself questions and actually start thinking about these problems in a slightly different way. Um, and then the take-home test, same idea. A lot of take-home tests are either about getting a data set and, and building an analysis, building an architectural diagram, or reading a research paper. I'll talk about this in a lot more detail, but you can do all of these things uh, yourself. Um, 
by yourself or with, with a colleague, uh, just asking the question, giving yourself a time limit and seeing how you actually uh, uh, address those issues. And so we'll talk a little bit about these uh, examples in terms of three specific roles, especially the whiteboarding test. But one of the things before we do that, that I want to remind folks from webinar two is how different the roles can be within companies. You know, two axes that we talked about were theoretical versus applied. Are you building things and solving problems tactically in an applied setting? Or are you a researcher where you're going to have to push ideas, but not necessarily write as much code? Are you internal to the company? Are you solving problems within your team? Or are you dealing with uh, with broader um, stakeholders, whether internal to the company like VPs or executives or actual clients that are external to the company. Depending on these roles, um, your interviews will be different. An applied internal role will be very, very, very focused on skill sets. They'll be focused on whether you can write code well. External uh, roles will be more focused on your presentation skills. Can you solve a problem, but can you also present that problem back to me? And so as you think about preparing for these different interviews and, and different roles, ask yourself that question. Who am I ultimately accountable to? And what does the company want me to be good at when I'm accountable to those individuals? If it's clients, they'll want me to present well. If it's delivering on, on and closing JIRA tickets and writing code that's really good and, and, and really performant, then I'll probably be doing a lot of internal tests um, to make sure that my coding capabilities are on par with what the company expects. So let's talk a little bit about what this actually looks like. Suppose that we're an e-commerce company and suppose that within this e-commerce company, we're growing our data science team drastically. Uh, we wanna become more data-driven, we wanna do more research and ultimately across the board, it's to drive revenue growth within this company. And we have three different types of candidates that we're gonna be looking at. We're gonna be looking at Jorge, who wants to be a data analyst for the company. We're going to be looking at Shona, who wants to be a data engineer. And we're looking at Mina, who wants to be an ML researcher. All of these individuals will be working together at some point, but their contributions will be very different. Um, and so let's look at what kind of tests and what kind of interviews we would expect each of them to go through, uh, specifically for the take-home test and the stakeholder presentation. Um, the phone screens, all of that stuff will be pretty high level, and we've covered those up a bit. So. Jorge, as a data analyst, we're going, to, we're going to expect that he actually knows how to analyze data. So we're going to want him to walk us through how he thinks about analytics, how he thinks about solving a specific business problem from an analytics perspective. A common take-home test here that, we, that, I, that I'm a big fan of certainly, but is very, very common, especially for roles like this, is we're going to give Jorge a data set. And we're going to say, from a role play perspective that he has about four hours to get to know the data a little bit and work with whatever tools he wants. It's not about the tools so much as about his approach to analysis. And we're gonna give him a specific problem. So in this case, in this specific scenario, we're going to ask him to build a customer segmentation. So we've got lots of customers. Our goal is to increase lifetime value of our customer segments. We'd like Jorge, to spend a few hours to build his point of view on what the customer segments should be and uh, specifically in a way that allows us to optimize lifetime value. And we'd like him to prepare a four slide presentation that he'll walk us through. So that's the exercise. What Jorge would do in those four hours is download the data set, open it up in again, whatever tool he wants. It's not about the tool, it's about his ability to analyze. And I would expect that the first hour or so, he's going to clean the data up a little bit, ask the data a few questions just to get a feel for it. Um, and then the two hours after that, he'll be hypothesis driven in terms of actually uh, uh, building segments. And then he'll spend maybe 30 minutes or so on the slides themselves. Now, we're not expecting, in a scenario like this, we're not expecting that these slides are the best slides he's ever come come up with, and we're not certainly expecting that he has the right segmentation. There is no right answer. That's the most important piece. What we're expecting Jorge to do is to come to us with an idea around segments and communicate them in a way that, un that we understand. And so oftentimes the question here is, are you hypothesis driven? You know, we've all shopped online probably at some point in our lives, if not many times. So we can probably make a few assumptions about what good segments might look like. 
people who shop on weekends versus weekdays could be one example, or people who buy kitchen items only for whatever reason. The point here is that he's thinking about the data and asking questions. A common mistake that I actually see here a lot uh, for analysts like this is they try to impress us with technical skills that are sometimes really, really difficult to understand. Very common approach here that's bad is, I'm gonna load this up into R or Julia, I'm gonna build a principal components analysis, and I'm gonna say here are four segments based on the factor analysis, and, 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 and here are the factors that contribute to the segments. And as soon as we ask, right, but what do the segments mean? How would you tell a marketer about what the segment does? People get really nervous because they realize they haven't thought about that question. And when you think about communication and strategic in input, that's important. So do you use common sense? Do you have empathy with the problem? And of course, do you communicate your segmentation well? If you can't communicate your findings, then uh, people probably won't trust them. People won't be able to use them. And as an analyst, that's what we really expect. The other piece that's important here is it is a four hour time limit. We know you don't have a lot of time and that's okay. We're not expecting the perfect answer. We just wanna see how far you get and what that looks like and how you deal with that pressure. Now, Shona, in Shona's case, she's going to be a data engineer. She wants to apply to be a data engineer. And so with data engineers, we know that that's a little bit more about architecting a solution, connecting uh, data pipelines or building them out in the first place. And so within this e-commerce retail framework, the question that we would have for her is, can you architect a product recommendation system? Suppose, you know, again, visit our website, play around with it. You know what sorts of data we might be collecting, or if you don't, just make assumptions. And uh, we think that we need a product recommender. So how would you actually, uh, how would you build one? What data would you need? And typically the questions that we look for here are, you know, um, and, and sorry, this, uh, the way that I'm framing it here is this is what we would tell Shona to do. Number one, tell us what input data you're gonna wanna collect. Tell us what you're gonna output when it comes to a product recommender and how will you measure success? Now, there's two ways that I've seen this sort of whiteboard exercise work. The first is that Shona goes off and thinks about this on her own for an hour or two and comes back with a more formal presentation. The other is that we're literally gonna whiteboard this together either with a shared PowerPoint slide or a Google doc or whatever else. And we wanna see how Shona thinks. Both approaches work really well. It really depends on the style of the company and, and, and how they, how they like to test. But the goal here is what is that ideal architecture? What assumptions are you making? And if you're actually building all of this out, how are you structuring your thinking so that we know that you're covering all your bases? Um, and again, we're not expecting you to be an expert on the product recommender side of things. We're really expecting you to use common sense and understand how models work. Um, so the first question that I'm asking when I'm really trying to evaluate Shona is, do you want, does she understand the models themselves? Uh, data engineers might not need to build models, but they certainly need to understand how, understand how the, the process of data and modeling works. Um, are they familiar with how data gets collected, how it gets stored, what an objective function is, and how model success might be evaluated? More importantly, does Shona understand the practicalities of data systems? Is she, you know, as she's thinking out loud and walking us through her approach, is she thinking about missing data or messy data? In the case of product recommenders or, or similar types of systems, there's this idea of a cold start problem. How do you build a model when you have no data yet? Maybe the company has never collected data that, like this before. How does she think about this? Is she thinking about scaling issues? Um, these are all things that we would be looking for. Again, there's no right answer. The point is, is she practical and really thinking about, about things well? And then of course, is she communicating this well? If all she's doing is a hand wavy, hey, I wanna know what people buy so we could predict other things people buy, that doesn't really help me. Um, but if she draws a diagram like the one you're seeing here, well, that's really powerful. And this, this diagram, by the way, I would say is like the perfect answer. Uh, it shows so much detail and it shows that there's a thought process and, a, and an architecture strategy. One book that I highly recommend, it's going to be uh, provided in the, in the links section of, uh, of the one pager that we share afterwards is uh, something called Machine Learning Design Patterns. One of the challenges with machine learning and data science today is that there isn't a common terminology for a lot of things, uh, or if, even if there is, people sometimes interpret it differently. Um, you know, I challenge you to tell me what the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse and a, and a, and a data fabric are. Um, they are different, but you know what? Most people in an interview might not actually 
uh, know or might not actually care. What they want to see is the tactical specifics and that you're communicating it well. And, and the book, uh, the reason I recommend it is they talk about architecture patterns. How do you communicate them well? How do you think about them? So that uh, you can solve problems strategically. Finally, there's Mina. So Mina is an ML researcher and uh, in her case, she will be building the models. So you could also see how things are flowing here, right? Um, Jorge might be the one who comes up with the idea that, oh, we need to personalize our, our customer experience. Um, and then Shona comes along and, and her job is to actually build the pipeline that will enable personalization. And then Mina's role is to actually build the model itself. And you could see also how they're going to be working together. You could see how different their, their roles actually are. When it comes to researchers, um, a common approach for a take-home test is to actually read a paper and critique it and discuss the research itself, both in terms of showing that Mina understood the paper, but also that she can critically think about and apply the research to our specific problem. So the question here would be, um, a, 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 in this case, it's a paper about using BERT and other types of natural language processing specifically for collaborative filtering, which is a type of uh, strategy within product recommendation systems. So Mina, please read the paper. Uh, tell us how you would apply this potentially to our problem with product recommendations. What data would we need to actually build a product recommender like this? Do you think we have that sort of data? If so, how would you structure your time to test that out or build the initial model? Mina would probably get this paper, well, almost certainly would get this paper ahead of time. So, you know, she's gonna read it on her own in preparation for the meeting. And then we're going to have an hour long discussion about the paper. Um, a few questions that will come up is one, can you summarize the paper? We don't mean reading the abstract, we mean like actually going into details that were compelling to you. Uh, how would you apply this paper to a product recommender at our company? Um, and what are the pros and cons of applying this paper to our system? Um, for example, if let's say we're just to dive into this, this specific idea of, let's say this paper is talking about using text descriptions of products for product recommendation uh, systems. Well, what if we don't have text descriptions of our product? Maybe we're an image only e-commerce website, or maybe our product descriptions are terrible. Um, similarly, Maybe the, the researchers here talked about uh, how interesting this approach is, but the computational complexity is very high. So is it actually worth building this out because it might actually take hours per data set to update or days per data set to update. So this won't be real time. It won't actually lead to a good customer experience, even if the model performance is good. Those are the sorts of questions that we would really want Mina to dive in on. And so from that perspective, what are we looking for here? Well, does she understand the paper? Um, first and foremost, I mean, if she's reading these papers and doing research, does she actually understand what the paper's talking about? Is she critically challenging the research? And again, we're not expecting someone to come in and blindly just say that um, this paper is bad or this paper is good, but rather in the context of our company, how, you know, we picked this paper for a reason. It's a, we think it's applicable. So why would you agree or disagree with that? And of course, do you communicate well? Um, are you able to share your thoughts and ideas in a collaborative way? And are we actually having a brainstorm and a discussion here? Uh, or is the person intimidated, nervous, or maybe likes to lecture instead of actually debate a problem or a solution? So that's how we look at um, uh, uh, the take-home test, the, uh, the process of the interview itself. And just as a, as a way to conclude um, uh, uh, the, the, the entire flow and the entire strategy, remember that a lot of this is about telling your story. And so when it comes to telling your story, uh, uh, as you might remember from webinar one, where we, we really tried to dive into this um, in a lot of detail, it's about your brand. It's about showing that you can contribute to the company and that you're going to be a great, great hire. Um, this means a few things. The first and most important thing is, um, you know, from an employer perspective, hiring is really hard and we need to have faith that you are going to do a good job. And there's a million reasons why we're going to make mistakes. And there's as, as I'm sure you know, hiring is not a perfect process. It's not, uh, it's, 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 it's not one that works very, very well. And different hiring managers are good at it. 
Some are not so good at it. Some are doing it for the first time. So what you really want to do is also help facilitate that process for the, for the entire team that you're meeting with. And a big part of that is de-risk their decision-making process. Think about all of the unknowns they have about you and show how you might be able to, to address them. When they first meet you, they don't know if your resume is truthful. They don't know if you can actually do the things that you said you can do. They don't know what you've accomplished in your life or what got you to where you are today. So walk them through all of that. Um, in a similar way, from a hiring manager perspective, the big piece here is, uh, can you solve their problem? Uh, you know, we just walked through three profiles, Jorge, Shona, and Nina. Well, it feels to me like the hiring manager needs to build a personalized uh, e-commerce experience. So if you're interviewing for this role or one of those three roles, coming in and saying, hey, I, I can do that. And I'm excited about that problem. And here are a few other ideas maybe you haven't considered. Uh, that's really exciting for hiring managers to address. And more broadly, show that you're actually a positive uh, contributor or a positive impact to uh, uh, to the company itself. You're curious, you enjoy sharing resources, you like ideating. All of this is really, really important. And as part of the process, uh, follow up. Make sure that within all of this, you're constantly building relationships with people. My personal recommendation is add everyone that you meet to LinkedIn, uh, build a relationship with them, um, uh, and, uh, and, and just learn how you can help. It's people constantly change jobs, go to new places. If you leave a positive impression with them, who knows when you're gonna meet them again. And so this means a few things from a, strate from a strategic perspective, do your research about the company, read annual reports or investor presentations, see how they get covered in the press, be solution oriented, but be flexible. And what I mean by this is you wanna come with ideas, but of course, you don't know the company as well as the folks there. Maybe they've already tried some of the things that you've done, or maybe they don't fully understand it. So be flexible in terms of how you present, or maybe as you take that data and their feedback, show how you can incorporate it into your own thinking. Um, have a vision for yourself. And most importantly, have a point of view on how the company can address its strategic challenges. Again, if you come in and you can show how you're gonna help the company be a better company, not just a better team for the team you're a part of, or not that you're just gonna solve the problems and check out at 5 p.m. every day, people will be thrilled to work with you. A few, a few tactics on what this means is thank the recruiters and hiring managers, ask for feedback um, regularly, um, uh, share resources, especially, especially again, uh, in a genuine way. If you actually have a resource that is worth sharing or you have a thought that maybe came uh, 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 to your mind after the actual interview, share all of that. Offer to provide help or support. Um, there's, I, I still think back to, to interviews that I've had seven or eight years ago where I've interviewed folks where maybe they didn't get the job or for whatever reason we felt it wasn't a, we, we weren't a good fit for each other, where I'm actually uh, friends with them. Um, I remember back when I was a consultant, uh, I interviewed someone and uh, they, we, I made an offer. They, they declined the offer, but we kept in touch. That person introduced me to my co-founder at Canopy Labs. Um, like, what are the odds, right? It's that relationship was so great, and we're, we're all still friends ten years later or eight years later, whatever it was. And from that perspective, one of the pieces that I really like to bring up here is, um, uh, if you don't get the job, ask for feedback. One of the things that also surprises me immensely here is how many stories I hear of candidates who did who were so close to getting the offer, they didn't realize it, but they didn't get the offer for, for whatever reason. They ask for feedback and the company realizes that, hey, maybe the person they actually made an offer to didn't accept or, uh, or alternatively um, something else happened or maybe they have budget for a new role and all of a sudden this person's like ask, asking for feedback, they're positive, they were close to getting an offer anyway and all of a sudden they have a job offer even though they were asking for feedback on why they didn't have one. This happens a lot more than I ever expected uh, uh, as I've been doing this over the years. Um, and even if that doesn't happen, if you incorporate the feedback the company gives you, then the second time around, you're gonna have a better process and a better experience for that company. The third time, fourth time, however long it takes, you will eventually get really good at this and get an offer from someone and they'll be thrilled to work with you. And finally, with regards to all of this, just remember to tell your story across the board. 
go back to webinar one if, if you're curious about how to optimize your LinkedIn, how to work on your portfolio. But a lot of this is an iterative process. If your company, as you were interviewing, didn't really quite understand your portfolio or didn't understand the research you were working on, that's a good piece of feedback on maybe changing the way you present yourself on the way you have your 30 second pitch or whatever else. And that's it for us. So thank you so much uh, for, uh, for listening in. And uh, we do have uh, a few minutes for questions now as well. And, uh, and certainly happy to address anything and everything that, uh, that has come up. Great, thanks so much, Wojciech. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience. So I wanna just jump into a few things here. So you, you just sort of talked about um, take home tests and did, did a deeper dive into that. Um, we, we've got a question around, you know, what we've sort of seen when it comes to take home tests and, and how employers come up with these. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that when it comes to take home tests, uh, a an employer might look into a past project or get old data and ask a candidate to sort of run that again or see, you know, how would you run this project uh, if you were to take it on? Um, I think that sometimes there can be a bit of sensitivity around, uh, is the candidate going to be performing uh, work for the company through the interview, or are they currently solving a, an existing problem for the company? So I'm sort of curious if you could just speak to how companies come up with these take-home tests, what you've seen out in the field. Sure. Um, so there, um, so a few questions, a few, a few points to bring up. I think first and foremost, I think the goal with the take-home test is how do we mimic your job as much as possible ahead of time? So if, uh, if we give you a date, so if you're going to be analyzing data within the company, we want to give you a data set to see how you analyze it. Um, we want to, ideally, we will mimic everything about your job, although this isn't always possible. And, um, and so from that perspective, when it comes to the strategy behind the scenes, that's really what we're trying to ask is, is what can we ask you that will show, uh, show these things for us? Um, now, uh, you know, to my point earlier about uh, this is a, an interview like this is as much uh, the company interviewing you as it is you interviewing them. I would say that there's a few things to watch out for where companies might not even realize they're doing this, but I think is really, really important. The first is if you actually feel like the company is getting you to do free work for them, that tell, that's usually a really bad sign for me because that's both disrespectful and frankly, um, I'm not sure how, how okay it is from an HR <laughs> perspective. And, and, and so you want to watch out for that because it's, it's, um, it's, it's certainly something you want to avoid. It, it, it tells me the employer isn't as positive as they're pretending to be. Number two is the length of time and the respect they give for, uh, for your time. We're all busy. Uh, as, you, know, you're, you're, you might be in school right now or you might be uh, uh, already working somewhere else. So when an employer says, this is a three-day project, that's a lot of time. I mean, if you don't have that kind of time, that's okay to push back on the employer, um, especially if you have a, a, a good reason for it. Um, so like, again, I have a full-time job. I mean, that's a really good reason for why I can't spend three days building this thing. Um, and so those are things that, that I would watch out for. Um, the, the, um, the, and, and by the way, how flexible they are to that feedback is important. So um, I would not have a problem uh, if a candidate told me that it wasn't possible for them to work on this in this way, or or that we might need to be a little more accommodating, that's perfectly fine. What we don't want to be accommodating on is the actual technical project, because we ultimately want you to do well, and you need to analyze the data. So we're not going to give you a new data set or a different data set or whatever else. Um, the last piece that I would say here is Sometimes uh, the take-home test, you might think you did really badly, but actually did really well. And I'll give one example that uh, I like, I love bringing this up is we gave a candidate um, a test like this where uh, it was similar to the Jorge challenge where we, um, where we uh, gave a data set and the candidate had three and a half hours to build a segmentation. Three and a half hours later, she says, I spent the entire time cleaning the data. This data is a mess. Uh, I didn't even get to the segmentation. And you know, on the surface, you might think, well, that's a terrible result. And one of the things that I became such a huge champion for this individual, because to me, 
what it meant was that they knew how data works and they knew they've done this so many times that they knew they can't trust the data and and they felt this was the right way to invest in it and and that was just so beautiful frankly from a process perspective and so these are the things you might want to be thinking about um, uh, as, as you're going through the take-home test great that's super helpful to hear you know and one of the things that uh, sort of has come up through the talk too is this focus on um, folks who are it sounds like interviewing for a bit more of individual contributor roles so curious what your advice would be around those who are looking to get hired into maybe mid-level or senior management roles, maybe roles where you'd be a bit more um, in the leadership position, leading a team, doing that sort of thing. What advice would you offer there when you're interviewing? Sure, I would say there's um, three things I would emphasize. Communication, strategic thinking, and project planning. Um, if you're actually gonna be managing a team or alternatively, um, Plan managing a project. So maybe you won't have direct reports, but you'll certainly have uh, uh, tasks that you're responsible for or will need to delegate. Um, it's, it's, project management is really hard. It's, it's hard for everyone, especially if they've only done, done it a few times. And so when you come in and, and present to the hiring manager or the uh, executives uh, in the stakeholder presentation, they you'll want to show that a you can plan projects and you think about the risks and know how to de-risk them you'll want to show that you can communicate well uh, people in leadership positions or management positions need to be good communicators if you are not a good communicator you will be a terrible manager um it's, it's I, i'm like i don't see how it's not possible or how it's possible for any other result um and uh the other piece that i would uh i would say here is there's a really interesting team dynamic to be aware of here. And this is something you'll wanna talk with your hiring manager about or recruiter about, because the team that you meet in this case might be a team that reports to you. So, and this isn't something that we've covered in the actual webinar here, but in this scenario, when you meet the team, the people there, you might be their boss, which is a very different dynamic because they're technically interviewing you but you will be actually managing their careers for them. And in those scenarios, uh, oftentimes the team will have a much stronger say in terms of whether you should be hired or not, because uh, as, as I'm sure we've all heard of research like this, where oftentimes people quit companies because of their managers. The last thing the company wants is to hire a bad manager that leads to the team turnover. Um, and also in a similar way, you'll be interviewing them because you'll want you'll you'll be delegating to them so having a good team structure dynamic is so important there these are all things that if you're applying for roles like this your hiring manager and recruiter will almost certainly tell you those details uh and if they don't then frankly i would say they're probably uh not very good at um hiring managers i'll, I'll be honest <laughs> fair enough um uh, when it comes to actually preparing for interviews, I, I know with your 50 role plays example, you talked about preparing with uh, cases. Uh, I'm curious, what are some um, resources that you find really helpful, especially for uh, data scientists, data analysts, engineers, for these types of AI roles that really help people get, get that practice that they're looking for? Sure. So I would say uh, two, two things uh, from a pure data science perspective. One is uh, there's a lot of open data sets out there. Kaggle is a good example, uh, but there are many. And just downloading data sets and asking yourself a question and seeing and giving yourself a time limit. So, you know, the e-commerce one I'm, I just mentioned, you can literally go to that website, uh, to the Kaggle site, find that data set and give yourself four hours to analyze the data. Um, if you want to work in computer vision, there's open source computer vision data sets, there's NLP data sets, they're all out there. And so what I would recommend here is if you're preparing for these things, the role play is basically that. It's download a data set, give yourself a, a task or a challenge and see how far you get. Um, because that is literally what will happen. And a good example here, just to show you of what not to do is um, I, again, it's, it's, it's something that surprises me is when I'm interviewing a candidate for a role like this and they have trouble loading the data. I mean, it's a CSV file. It's like, this isn't, this is the part you should have, 
done a million times, right? And so if that's what you're tripping up on, then I'm really concerned about how you're gonna uh, get through the, the full interview. Um, that's one example, but it's not the only one, of course, but those are repeatable tasks that you will almost certainly deal with every time you download a data set. The other piece is there's um, lots of uh, open, uh, openly available research papers on the archive, for example, or within your university, you could download papers via your library. Same idea, give yourself the challenge of, of uh, read the paper and in an hour, see if you can apply this to a specific problem. The whole point is that problem solving and that applied problem solving piece, because in particular, I find a lot of academic environments don't stress this part. They, you know, you'll be able to critique a paper if you completed a PhD, but can you critique a paper in the context of a business problem is a very different thing. And, um, and for all of these, I would also say when you're presenting, record yourself. Uh, record yourself, watch yourself, see where you're maybe not so clear, have a friend watch the recording or just have them actually watch the, the pitch itself and see if they understand things or not and time yourself. Uh, the other piece that I'll, I'll say is within a lot of this part of the challenge is the candidate takes 20 minutes to answer a question and in an hour long setting, we've just lost 33% of the interview. So, um, and, and sometimes we won't, we're, we're almost too shy to actually interrupt them where it seems like they're going somewhere. So we're not sure if we should. So being comfortable with timing is really, really valuable. Nice thing about video today is I, I see my clock. I can constantly see how much time has passed. So, so those are, those are some tactics you can use to prepare. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll throw just a couple more questions at you since we have a few minutes left. Um, one of them is uh, around Glassdoor reviews. So we know that this is a really great resource to go to when you're trying to look at either interview questions that uh, have been asked candidates in the past or just about the company. And sometimes uh, the reviews can be a little bit more negative and people can sort of dive into those details there. How, how, um, how would you recommend sort of weighing that sort of feedback and maybe even asking about it in an interview? Like how... How does that help someone sort of prepare their, their vision for what it might look like to work at this company? That's a great question. And Glassdoor, I have a love-hate relationship with those reviews for many reasons. But what I will say, a few things to be aware of. Um, number one is that companies actually um, can put up reviews themselves. A lot of companies will ask employees to put up positive reviews. Uh, sometimes negative reviews are very negative because people are disgruntled. And so uh, I bring this up because I think it's also, so first and foremost, it's impo impo uh, important to read between the lines. What I look for when I'm thinking about working with a company or, or even applying or recommending someone apply is uh, how do they deal with bad reviews? A company that has an intelligent, thoughtful response to a negative review tells me a lot about how thoughtful and intelligent their response will be when I have a negative thought or maybe I need feedback. Um, but if I come to a website or a glass door section where every single post is actually positive and says like great culture, great everything, blah, 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 I actually don't learn very much about the company and, and, and that's a problem. Um, and uh, the other piece that I think is important here from that perspective is that I think um, actually asking your recruiter or hiring manager uh, about the work culture and validating whatever concerns you may be developed by reading Glassdoor reviews or, or other review pages, um, validate those concerns uh, with your team or with, uh, uh, with, with the recruiter and hiring manager. Ask them to clarify, or maybe if you, if you have a concern, definitely bring it up. That's so important. But also just when you're meeting your team, ask them what the culture is like and does their feedback align with what you've been reading online. The other piece that's really valuable here too is see how, how, what the turnover is like. If, if companies with a lot of turnover, there's usually a reason for that and it's almost never a positive one. Uh, and so that you can see on LinkedIn, for example, uh, where did people come from where did they leave and what did they do next? Some companies pride themselves in being an intense environment where a year later, you just, you're, you're even more hireable and turnover is a good thing. Um, is that actually happening? In other cases, is it an environment where people stick around for a long time um, and why or why not? So uh, a lot of this is think critically and really challenge, challenge everything. That's great. Thank you so much, Wojciech. Um, just for time sake, uh, We'll wrap up there with the questions, but appreciate you uh, being able to answer as many as we can. 
Well, uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. And of course, thank you to the Vector Institute for coordinating and, and running these these webinars as well. It's been it's been a pleasure to do these three, and uh, and of course, uh, we're we're looking forward to staying in touch with folks if they have any questions. Feel free to reach out as well. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you.